Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Friday's Fireside Chat, which I am absolutely delighted to say is with my buddy, Dory Clark, uh, who is an executive coach and author and award-winning thinker and all these really wonderful things. Um, and we're trying something new this week, which is to just sort of have a little fun with the fact that we're all in uh, <laughs> this mode. Uh, so, you know, take a picture, take a selfie, post it to Instagram, and uh, I've got a whole team that's watching them, and they will be uh, monitoring what we're up to as we as we go forward. So, um uh, that's all the information. You'll also see it in the chat and uh, look forward to enjoying all that uh, with us. So Dory, welcome. Rita, I'm so glad to see you. Thanks for having me. <laughs> great, great to see you. So for those of you that don't know Dory, I hardly believe that's conceivable, but there may be some who don't. Um, you and I first met when you had your very first book, which was Stand Out, as I recall. And we met in Las Vegas. You were there with your mother, if memory serves me. And we were at this like massive, what was it? The multimedia convention. Like all the people in media were there. Like the guys that sell booms and the guys that sell cameras and the people that do all this other stuff. Um, yeah, it was, it was the it was the broadcasters association. Something yes. like that. Yeah. I mean, I, but they booked at like every venue in Las Vegas. And I very quickly learned that they, um, like the taxi line is not something you should just assume you know, like to get from place to place is not easy. And, uh, but I had never been to an event like that before. So meeting you was really <laughs> very interesting. <laughs> and then later on, um, you did some work with us with executive education at Columbia and we got to meet the Cronut guy. We, we took a whole class on a field trip to meet Angelique Genzel. And uh, that was wonderful and got to see the origination of the Cronuts and a genuine um, innovator. So, um, so Dory's books, for those of you that don't know them, are Stand Out, Reinventing You. Uh, so that Stand Out I showed you, Reinventing You is this one. And I know I have the other one here somewhere, but the place is coming down with books. Yeah, so. don't, don't worry. Right. I can help. Here we go. There we go. All right. Excellent. <laughs> Teamwork. Team totally, totally. And you have a new book coming up. I do. I do. I don't, I don't yet have a, a physical rendering to show you, but it's called The Long Game, How to Be a Long-Term Thinker in a Short-Term World. It is due out September 21st. Oh, great. And so are you doing a big pre-order campaign? I will be. I will be. Yes. So uh, um, September sounds like a long way away. America. Sorry. I'm sorry. You. September sounds like a long way away, but it it's not. <laughs> no. Oh my gosh. I, I, I That's the thing about book marketing. I already feel behind. <laughs> it's like, oh no. I feel behind before I even write the thing. <laughs> like People are asking me what my next book's about. And I'm like, I just, didn't I just do this? <laughs> yeah, anyway. So are, are, out of curiosity, are you already thinking about a new book or are you just, you know, sort of banishing the thought from, from your mind for the time being? Well, with me, the way the process works is I'll have ideas I think are intriguing and they all kind of go in this big bucket. And then eventually, and it's unpredictable, eventually what starts to happen is they coalesce around a theme. And the theme has to make itself felt over multiple occasions before I realize it's maybe strong enough to support a book. The kind of books I don't like are the ones that are really, they're monographs. And then, you know, and then somebody says, well, it has to be a book. So we make it book length. I, I like something that has a little more depth to it. So, um, yeah. So I am thinking about another book, what it will be. I do not know yet, um, but I've got some ideas. And I think, you know, the pandemic adds a different flavor to it, uh, which is my most recent book, as you know, is about strategic inflection points. And it's sort of like, once you've got, maybe it's about once you've gone through the inflection point, now what do you do? <laughs> you know, like, right. Well, we could all use that. That's for sure. Well, one of the reasons I was so pleased um, to have you come and join me by, by the fireside, note it's um, it's Feb mid of, middle of February. So unlike the middle of August, we actually have the fire on. Um, you know, a, a theme that comes up a lot and which I touch on in my work is the I call it the tour of duty career after uh, Reed Hoffman and Chris Ye's book by the same account. And while a lot of people get that now, it's like, oh, yeah, yeah, okay, I've got to be entrepreneurial about my career, I've got to think differently, yada, yada, yada. But I think a lot of people are really not yet on top of what that really means. And, uh, you know, I think you're one of the people that's really embraced this, not necessarily what you thought you would be doing, but but you've really trying to sort of taken the disappointments and the experiences you've had and turned it into a really fascinating tour of duty, entrepreneurial career. So maybe take us back to the beginning and what you thought you were going to be doing <laughs> and how, how that took you on a number of twists and turns and then how that led to what you're doing now. Yeah, thank you very much, Rita. 
So for me, as I look back on my career arc, there's two interesting things that stand out. Uh, the first one is that all of the things that I wanted to do or I thought I was going to do when I was a teenager and envisioning a future career, I actually, in one form or another, have managed to do them. You know, I wanted to be a professor. I wanted to write books. I wanted to make documentary films. You know, I, I, and I've had the chance to do all of those things. But literally all of them have come about in vastly different ways than I imagined. And uh, the ways that, you know, 20 or 25 years ago, you would have done those things. Uh, in many cases, those doors have closed. And mm -hmm. so uh, mm -hmm. you can still attain the goals, but you have to be uh, sort of crafty and entrepreneurial, uh, even to figure out how to do it. So as just one example, I thought I wanted to have a career in academia. And so after I got my master's degree, I applied to doctoral programs and I ended up getting turned down by all of them, literally all <laughs> of them. Ouch. <laughs> it was, it was very unfortunate. I was uh, certainly not expecting to get zero acceptances. And so I had to, I had to scramble. I had to figure things out really quickly. And now of course, years later, uh, I have uh, the, the wonderful uh, opportunity and honor to teach in some wonderful programs, including, you know, you bringing me in and doing some work at Columbia, which has been wonderful. I teach for the Fuqua School of Business at Duke. I have taught at, at business schools around the world. Uh, but I, I really came in through the side door on that. I still never got a doctorate, uh, but I was able to sort of you know, earn my right, I say in quotation marks, to be able to teach through my experience and doing the sort of professor of the practice type thing. Uh, so you can find a way, but you have to be a little crafty sometimes. Yeah. And I think, you know, you, you've, you've talked about being part of presidential campaigns that didn't go so well and journalism kind of didn't work out and the professor thing, well, it helps to get admitted to a program. Um, and yet, you know, you've really turned that into, I think, a, a very interesting series of experiences. And one of the things I talk about a lot is, is you know, failure, which is a word I have a very love-hate relationship with, but things not working out as expected, let's call it that way, and how that can actually prove to be a useful catalyst, um, especially in the context of personal inflection points and, you know, what it would force you to consider that maybe you hadn't even thought about before. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, of, of course, uh, at the time, we always want things to work out the way we want things to work out. You know, it's much, it's much simpler and nicer in the moment when that happens. But it, it turns out that there are some retrospective advantages. I mean, one of them being, if I had managed to, you know, just to take the example of academia, if I had managed to come in the traditional way and get accepted to a doctoral program that would have put me on a, a clearer path, that's for sure. But it also in some ways is a bit of a path to nowhere because the industry was changing so dramatically. The idea that, oh, well, of course you're going to get your doctorate and then you're going to get a tenure track job and then you're going to get tenure. That was a system that worked really well for a long time. It is really not working now. I mean, almost everywhere is trying their hardest to eliminate tenure track positions to the extent feasible and turn everyone into an adjunct. Now we can debate, you know, for better or for worse about that, um, but it would have it would have been extraordinarily difficult headwinds to be entering. And so the fact that I was actually in the in the vanguard of, <laughs> of being rejected for that system forced me to innovate and actually in some ways get ahead of the curve and recognizing, okay, if I actually want to do academia, I'm going to have to do it differently. Mm -hmm. Similarly, getting laid off as a, as a journalist, I was one of the first journalists to get laid off. It was kind of the, the last in first out scenario. I was, I was uh, hired in 2000 and fired in 2001, wow. but 40% of American journalists lost their jobs over a 15 year period. I mean, it's just a decimation. Mm -hmm. And the fact that I was uh, early to lose my job meant that I was able to get out ahead of it. So sometimes there are silver linings embedded mm -hmm. in these situations. Mm -hmm. When were you applying for your doctorate? Uh, I was doing that in 19... 1999. Oh, got it. Okay. Yeah. Well, you're absolutely right in terms of timing. So my story is about a decade earlier. So um, 
back in the 80s, right, when we had the rise of financial services. And if you mapped onto that chart, the rise of the traditional two-year MBA program, you would have had almost a perfect correlation because there was so much demand in the 80s. And by the late 80s, what had happened was two things. The There was the, I think it was called the Hatch Commission said, you know, you people in academia should not be just hiring professors. You should not be hiring business people and calling them professors. You should actually have people with PhDs. And so by the late 80s, if you could stand in front of a room with a piece of chalk in your hand, you would get a job in academia, in business school academia. Um, but that whole thing completely turned, as you pointed out, um, to the point where I think it's a really risky pursuit now. And I'm interested not so much in business schools, but in a lot of our sister institutions, um, people are actually pausing admissions to their doctoral programs. They're saying, look, let's make sure we have jobs for the people we already have in, in flight, you know, as it were, and not... Um, so you have these sort of really disappointing experiences, where do you start, right? Because I think for a lot of people, especially people who are on the wrong end right now of this pandemic that we're living through, where the career they thought they were going to have is not either not there or it's not taking off or it's certainly not taking off in the way that we thought. So how do you get started thinking about that change of direction and not, not, not sort of sink into a depression? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I think in, 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 some ways for this, it's like many things. The first battle is with yourself because for many people, it is easy. It's the, it's the sort of first reflex to assume that if the external gatekeepers are saying no, that obviously they know something you don't, that obviously they must be right. And I think it is really, really important to emphasize they don't, they don't know what they're doing either. I mean, you know, what I like to tell people is if a hundred people turn you down, if a thousand people turn you down, then okay, maybe there's some data in there. If one or or even 10 people turn you down, that is their opinion. That is their circumstance. And we really have to understand that if we want to be successful in persevering and accomplishing what we want, we cannot take other people's external authority uh, seriously. <laughs> we have to. We have to say, you know what? Fine. I'm going to make. You know, I mean, this. This was the. You know, this was the. The feeling that I had is that I was going to make it my life mission to make every single person who turned me down may feel like on their deathbed, that was the worst mistake of their life. <laughs> that's, that's, that's been my goal. It's, it's a North star. I'm working toward it every day, Rita. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and sometimes those kind of things can be incredibly motivating, right? Uh, there's an old country music song, um, and I had a setback in academia, and the country music song goes something like, I've got better things to do, you know, I could, I could change my new guitar strings, I could wash my car in the rain, you know, I've got better things to do than this. <laughs> Totally. My anthem, same thing. So first battles with yourself. Okay. So you, you decide, you know, you're going to keep your own counsel and be your own best advocate. What do you do next? Sure. So when it comes to, uh, to, to reinvention and to, uh, to trying to, to pick up the pieces when the thing you wanted to do is no longer a possibility, uh, sort of the next move that, that, I, uh, that I performed personally, and this is something that I actually talk about quite a, quite a lot in, in this book, Reinventing You, which is really about uh, professional reinvention, is you, you want to look for adjacencies, right? Um, you have been aiming at something. You've been training for something. The good news is that the skills that you have been developing are transferable. And so for me, uh, you know, the next move, I, I was, you know, I didn't have a plan B. I didn't, I didn't assume that I was going to be turned down. But when I was forced to have one, I thought, all right, I wanted a job where I could read a lot and think a lot and write a lot. What else is like that? And so I ended up in journalism and, uh, you know, academia and journalism are not that far apart. It was actually a, a reasonably good choice. Now, sometimes the thing you settle on, as, as in my case, um, it also is a house built on sand. And so sometimes it takes a little while to find something that can be a permanent resting place. But I also have to say, in terms of the work that I ultimately ended up doing, you know, having my own consulting business and entrepreneurial venture, the training that I had in that year as a journalist is one of the most valuable things that, that I possess because so much of my work, even these days, is about writing. So it's really a, an important part of the toolkit. So I would say it's, it's looking around for adjacent places where you can apply your skills. And here's the trick. Many people won't see them. 
because other people have very limited views about our careers. They're like, oh, well, you, you, uh, you're a lawyer. You don't want to be a lawyer. Mm, you could be a law professor. Like, I mean, they're so incredibly uncreative. Mm -hmm. um, so we have to be the ones to understand not just the line item on the resume, but the deeper skills underneath. In Reinventing You, I tell the story about a woman who had trained to be a, uh, a, a law professor, decided she didn't want to be one. And everybody else is sort of discouraging her. Oh, you spent 10 years doing this. Why would you give it up? Why would you give it up? But she realized that she had great speaking skills that she had honed from her training as a, you know, in persuasion and public speaking and being a lawyer. And she realized that she had great language skills that she had picked up in the course of getting her doctorate in law. And so she ended up becoming a consultant in the wine industry so that foreign vintners hired her to, uh, to, to market their products in the United States. It's totally unrelated, but it built on the baseline skills she had developed and, and she's built a dream career. Mm -hmm. I love that. that. That does sound like a dream career. Well, so, you know, one of the things that um, I, I find in, in the work that I do, and particularly the work I do with, with women, so I run this course at Columbia called Women in Leadership, aside from my growth course, which you've been kind enough to join me on on several occasions. Um, but the Women in Leadership course, you know, you ask women what they want, and very often they'll say something like, I want to be a, you know, a law person, a, a lawyer in a white shoe law firm, or I want to be the director of marketing for blah, blah, blah. And what I find is they don't go beyond that. So if you say to them, well, why do you want to be director of marketing? And if you really, really, really push them, maybe over a couple of glasses of wine, you'll finally get to, well, because that means I can enable creative people around me and I can um, bring, you know, new ways of thinking to life and I can, uh, uh, you know, provide mentoring for younger people. And so then the next thing I ask them is, well, where are other ways you could do that? So yes, becoming vice president of marketing at a Fortune 500 firm, maybe that would allow you to do that. Maybe it won't also, that's the other thing to remember. Um, but but there's many paths to that to that outcome. And I think people forget that. Yeah, such a, such a good point. We, we tend to get fixated on a certain way of accomplishing something. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, like, it, it's like the things you teach in your innovation courses, right? When, when you get uh, this kind of mental lock-in, it becomes very damaging because we, you know, we're, we're like automatons, just like repeating the behavior and, you know, doing, doing the thing. And it, it can prompt a crisis when, when somehow that thing is cut off or that thing is blocked because it seems like the only answer, it seems like the only option. And of course it isn't, it's, you know, it is almost never that there is one possibility. Mm -hmm. Usually there's a lot of possibilities, but we fail to see them. Mm -hmm. So one of our, our listeners wants to know, uh, why didn't you get accepted? What caused you to get laid off? And how did that change you? <laughs> <laughs> it, precisely what is wrong with you, Dory? That's what we want to know. Yeah, we do, totally. <laughs> Here, we can, we can open the vein. It's good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It. well, you know, and it's, it's not even noon yet. So I'm afraid you're going to have to do this without any kind of artificial stimulation. <laughs> That's right. That's right. Well, I, okay. So why I think I got turned down for the doctoral program, I was applying to be, I wanted to be a literature professor. And I think that why I got turned down for the doctoral program is I did very well, very well on the general GREs, but I had been a philosophy major as an undergrad. And so I did poorly, I guess you could say, I mean, not terribly, but I didn't do great on the subject test for literature for the GRE. Like I really actually knew I was in trouble. They they literally had a question asking you to translate Beowulf from the original medieval English, and you know what? If you actually um, haven't studied that in depth, that's challenging. So uh, my scores were not that good on the subject test. So I think that is why I got turned down for that. And why did I get laid off from the newspaper? I got laid off because I was writing for something called the Boston Phoenix, which was an alternative weekly newspaper. It's kind of the, uh, you know, it's like a, a subgenre of uh, media that is a little bit quasi extinct now, but the village voice was the most famous. I was going to say that sounds like the village voice, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it was, you know, it was like, it was like hip people doing hip stories. And, uh, and basically it was funded by porn 
is the answer. Um, that's how they funded themselves is they would have ads for like one nine hundred and like escorts and whatever. Oh, and, totally. you know, surprise, surprise. Um, and we, you know, it's a great, I mean, it's like Playboy, right? It's a like great journalism backed by <laughs> smut. And uh, anyway, the surprise, the internet managed to take a lot of that business. Yeah. And so uh, our paper was hit very hard and very fast by the, by the rise of the internet. So 2000, 2001, that's exactly when it's happening. So our advertising revenue base declined and they said, you know what? Um, we don't really have room for a political reporter, uh, a local political reporter anymore. So bye. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's interesting to reflect on those things. Um, but you're right. And and actually, one of the things that um, I, I talk about in Seeing Your Own Corners is how, you know, you're just do, kind of doing your job, right? And then something comes out of left field. So the analogy I would use is, you know, you're in your industry and you know, I'm in aerospace when I'm a you know, third market share player in aerospace and somebody comes along and says, well, actually we have holograms and nobody needs to fly anymore. <laughs> Where did that come from? <laughs> right? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, you know, I remember when, when like the internet seemed like such a far away thing, even in 2000, 2001. I mean, I, I knew that our newsroom was a little bit behind, you know, because we were this small, scrappy newspaper. But literally in 2001, when I was writing for the paper, we, we all had computers, but there was only one computer in the newsroom that had the internet. We had to take turns on that computer so we could access the internet when, you know, if we were like looking things up, like that's how far off it seemed. And did it have a dial up modem is what I wanted. To know. <laughs> you know, we might've, we might've. And then, you know, like five minutes later, it ate the entire newspaper right. industry. Exactly. Exactly. So, um, so we talked about, so you, you have a setback of some kind or something that changes the world as you know it, you, you look for alternative possibilities. And that's where a lot of people, I think, sort of stop. They're like, oh, well, you know, I could have been an opera singer if I had this sort of set of magical things happen. So in between that sort of, well, let me explore that space and actually doing something with it. So just for those of you that don't know Dory, she's got a phenomenal suite of online courses, obviously the books, she coaches, she does communication consulting. You do, and you've got all these different sort of streams of, of activity that you're involved with. Um, how do you go from this concept to actually making that happen? Because I, I mean, I know a lot of people that say things like, well, I could do an online course, you know, if I had made the time or I could do it, whatever, you know, and it's all this sort of talk, but they don't actually do it. <laughs> so how do you cross over that? Yeah, it, it's such an important question. So actually, in, in my new book, The Long Game, I talk about this a bit, because it, in many ways, it is, it is a sort of long game question, right? No one is ever going to be um, telling you, oh, you, you, know, you really have to do this right now. Like the, the problem that we have so often is that we just kind of go on about our business and then calamity strikes and every, everything's an emergency because we haven't prepared for other outcomes or other possibilities. Um, in, in Reinventing You, I talk about the difference between what I call capital R reinvention, which is this you know kind of like dramatic, like, oh, you lost your job or it's like a big change, big sudden change versus lowercase r reinvention, which is the sort of smaller shifts or the habits or the daily practices or the ways that you keep yourself ready to be able to, uh, to, to pivot and shift where you need to. And so, you know, we think about... Um, Google popularized the concept of 20% time. I mean, before that, 3M had their 15% time. Uh, but you know, the basic idea is that you have this, this portion, this smaller portion of your work week, let's say, and you spend it on more speculative activities. And I am a huge fan of that concept. Um, it is hard to actually do it. You have to have quite a bit of, of willpower in order to uh, to dive into it or to systematize it. In the book, actually, in the long game, I profile uh, a guy who works at Google because even many people at, at Google, you know, now Alphabet, uh, say, oh, you know, 20% time, that's not a thing, no. But but this, this one guy actually, and I mean, it's more than him, of course, but he's a good exemplar. He has really dived into the 20% time and it has advanced his career dramatically. And so I think for all of us, we have to be really, really conscious of this question. How do we take, you know, 
How can we make sure that we are not just tripping from emergency to emergency, but instead are cultivating small bets on the side? The, you know, 20% of your time, it's not enough to bankrupt you if it doesn't work. Like who cares if it doesn't work? You've learned some stuff along the way, but, but it's enough that over time and compounded, if you are steadily doing it, you actually at the end have something pretty substantial. And if you need to shift or if you, know, if you want to shift, there's something meaningful that you can shift into that you have cultivated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I think the same analogy applies um, at a corporate level, right? So something I talk about a lot with companies is, you know, build those options for the future, you know, because, because that you don't, you don't, at the moment that you're investing in them, they look insignificant, but by the time you need them, you know, you really want them to be there. Uh, another of our mutual friends is uh, Whitney Johnson, who of course writes about making your way up successive S curves of, of learning. And, and I think having the courage to leap from one S-curve to another implies you've already got some of those new skills and capabilities in the bank, or it would be too scary uh, to do that. Too scary. Yeah, yeah, that's that's exactly right. I mean, my, you know, my own personal example where I've tried to live this out is I decided now five years ago uh, in January of 2016, I decided that I wanted to learn to write musical theater. And that was nothing I had ever done before. I had no training in it. I had no experience in it. I wasn't, I honestly wasn't even that familiar with the musical theater canon. I had to familiarize myself with it. But over the course of the past five years, I have number one, repeatedly exposed myself to humiliation because I, <laughs> like, I'm around all these people who are way better than I am. Um, but I, you know, if you train for something for five years, actually, you kind of get good. So I'm a lot better than I was when I started. And, you know, I'm still perhaps not the best. I haven't put in my 10,000 hours, so to speak yet, but I am, I am, um, you know, more, I'm more than passable at this point because of, of the effort over this five years. But I did it because in my head, I had a 10 year trajectory and, you know, you're just, you can't get there overnight. But, uh, you know, the, the saying, which I think is quite powerful, we always overestimate what we can accomplish in a day and we underestimate what we can accomplish in a year. And certainly it's true of we underestimate what we can accomplish in a decade. Absolutely. Absolutely. And what I kind of like about that is so musical theater is its own genre. Right. But. At the same time, then back to this notion of adjacencies, it's about storytelling, it's about immersing people in the experience, it's about creating this you know, irresistible alternative world to the one that they live in every day. And that actually, those things have huge relevance to a lot of different fields um, uh, of endeavor. Yes. Um, so we talked a little bit about books and where the inspiration for books comes from. So what got you interested in the long game? Because that, that seems like a bit of a, I mean, it's, it's, it's logical, but, but it also seems like a, another stretch out from what you've typically been writing about. Yeah, it's, it's certainly a less, uh, it has many strategies and tactics in it, but I would say at its heart, it's not really a tactical book. It's kind of more of a big idea book. Yeah, uh, I was going to say, that, I think that's, that's a good way of framing the differences, because a lot of your previous books have been very much, you're in this moment, what do you do next? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Part of the reason that I wanted to start writing that, Rita, actually, is over the past five years, another thing that I started in 2016 was I launched, uh, speaking of online courses, I launched an online course in a community called Recognized Expert. And so over the past five years, I've worked with more than, I think now at this point, it's more than 550 participants in this course and have really gotten to, to know them and their challenges and their struggles really well. And the premise of the course is it's for you know, smart, talented professionals that want to become recognized experts in their field. They are good at what they do, but, you know, it, it's hard to figure out how do you get your ideas noticed? How do they get heard? There's so much competition. It, it just, you know, can be a mystifying process. And so having worked with these folks, I, I just kept hearing the same things again and again. And a lot of it is a sense of frustration that, you know, why isn't this happening faster? You know, what, what do I have to do around here to, you know, to sort of get noticed? Because we have this polarity, right? That, that on one hand, literally everyone knows. We've all heard a hundred thousand times that, okay, overnight success is not a thing. You know, it doesn't happen overnight. It takes time. On the other hand, nobody actually tells you how long it does take. There is no information about that. And you look around and it seems like everybody else has got it figured out. 
like, oh, well, on Instagram, they're doing blah, blah, blah. <laughs> and you start to doubt yourself. You start to worry, oh, am I on the wrong track? Am I good enough? And this is how talented, smart people who should get their ideas heard sort of drop out of the system because they get discouraged or they don't know how to do it or they're blocked and then that's it. And I don't want the world to lose those ideas. I want, we need the good ideas. I want us to harvest them. And so I wrote this book really as a way of trying to provide a guide for people so that they can get, make it through that trough and understand what it looks like to actually get from, okay, I know it's not overnight to, to being able to do what is necessary to get to the other end where they are as successful as they want to be and their ideas are heard as widely as they want them to be. That's very cool. That's very cool. So Thanks. can you take us through the arc of that book? So how do you, how do you set it up and what are some of the key stories? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, we're, we're, we're literally still finalizing it as, as we speak, uh, as I was mentioning earlier. You heard I, it here first, folks. <laughs> yeah, li literally turned in the text this week. But, you know, broad, broadly speaking, the arc is that, first of all, one of the challenges that we face is we are so busy, we're so frenzied. And so one of the first issues is that it is really hard to plan for the long game if everything in your life is conspiring to have you focus moment to moment in this incredibly narrow sense. And so somehow we have to learn to break out of those traps so that we have the mental space to even begin to conceptualize about what the long term can look like. Look like. So I provide strategies for how to think about that, strategies for how to actually effectuate that. And, you know, then once we actually create a little bit of bandwidth for ourselves so that we so that we actually can start thinking about the future and what we want and want it, want it to look like, then it becomes a question of how do you get uh, more strategic with the way that you're deploying your time? And so I, I talk about strategies around thinking like, well, what what do you do when? You know, when you are investing in your professional growth, um, I, I like to call it thinking in waves about your career. And, you know, what do you emphasize or de-emphasize at certain moments so that you can set yourself up for more success? And, you know, we kind of go through that process. And along the way, we talk about things like, you know, how do you cultivate the connections that you need so that, uh, because, you know, we don't know what the future holds. And so how do you create the kind of network that actually is alive with enough possibility that it can sustain you and spark you regardless of where you go. And, uh, and then, you know, we, we bring people through to really having to conceptualize what success looks like for them and understanding that, um, you know, there's, there's sort of standard measures and standard metrics, but if we are smart enough to optimize for things that are right, for us, we can actually have disproportionate success, even if it's uh, totally different and, and, you know, than what other people think about. So I tell the story about a friend of mine named Dave Crenshaw, who one of the things that he was really fixed on and has managed to do for years now, he takes two months off work. I mean, this is pretty rare for an American. He takes every July and every December off work. Uh, he's self-employed and he's set up the structures from the outset to enable him to do this, to spend time with his family. And so we can accomplish almost anything if we are clear about what that outcome is and sort of work backwards from it. That's really inspiring. Um, and you've talked a lot about purpose and, and finding purpose and meaning. And you know, there's a, there's a ton of research, and this is both corporate and individual, that connects having a compelling sense of purpose. It, it guides what you make choices about, it guides what you invest in, what you don't invest in, what you say no to. Um, do you think you've sort of crystallized that for yourself now, or is this still a quest? Well, in you know, in terms of, of my own purpose, I mean, it, it's a it's a good question. I feel like there's multiple answers to that. I mean, in the in the nearer term, uh, certainly one of the things that really does animate me. I mean, I I, I feel like I, I have so much love for the people in my community. You know, my sort of recognized expert folks and the folks who I do, who do consulting and and coaching with me and things like that. I really feel like. Um, 
you know, I, <laughs> it's kind of a funny metaphor, but like, I feel like they're like my ducklings, you know, like in the public garden in Boston and, you know, they dress, they dress the, the ducks up and they all wear socks, caps and things like that. I'm like, yes, I like these, these are, these are the people that I want to take care of and help and help them blossom and accomplish what they want. And that's very, that's very meaningful uh, for me. I also think that, um, you know, I'm not, I'm not sure if that's kind of the, the be all and end all uh, professionally. I feel like there's other goals that I have as well. And I talk about this in the long game that, you know, one of my goals that I set 10 years ago when I had just started writing musical theater is that I wanted to have a show on Broadway in 10 years. So the 2026 season. So I am a lot closer to it now than I, than I ever have been. I don't know if I'll have a show on Broadway in the 2026 season. Uh, I don't even know if Broadway will be open for the 2026 season. I certainly hope so. <laughs> I didn't really see that pandemic situation coming. But, um, but nonetheless, you set long-term goals and you work toward them. Uh, so there's a, lot of, there's a lot of possibilities. And you know, with the 20% time, you leave room for things to unfold. Uh, so, so yeah, it's kind of, a, kind of a both and in terms of the discovery process. How do you think about your purpose, Rita? What, what does that mean to you? Oh, um, that's a great question. Um, I think for me, um, the, the, where I've landed, I think is, is that I'm, I think I'm good at seeing patterns and helping people understand where they need to be thinking constructively about the future in a way that can really contribute to all stakeholders. Um, so I'm a big believer in that. Certainly at a core, if I were to think about what I wanna do in terms of corporations, it's really helping them develop long-term healthy business and growth prospects where you know, there's a good balance between well, stakeholders, right? What they're doing for their people, what they're doing for their communities, what they're doing, yes, for their customers and, and, and so forth. And I think we've gotten very out of balance of late. So one of the things I'm pretty passionate about is how do we, put business in the right place. Because I do think capitalist businesses are the most powerful force for transformation humankind has ever known. Uh, but you have to, you know, the rules of the road have to make sense for a, a, a decent balance. So that's something I'm pretty passionate about. Um, of late, I've kind of thought of myself in terms of Rita McGrath, the person is all about insight and ideas and, and so forth. And so I started a side not really a side business, but a separate business that uh, is about capability creation. And, and I would love to see the two, I think my next phase is really, I'd love to see those two come together where it's not just about the insights and you come to a class and like the scales fall from your eyes and this is awesome. And then you go back home and it's like, well, is it a spreadsheet? Is it a power, like a power, like how do I do it? Is it a monthly, like, how do I do this thing? <laughs> so I'm very interested now in helping people learn to do that. And I think- Yeah, make it real. Be, you make it real. And I think that's going to be a big part of my portfolio going forward. Um, so yes, on the Rita McGrath side, there'll be books and things, but on the Valise side, which is what I call the company, uh, that'll be much more about building capability, learning to do new things in a sensible way, doing digital transformation so you don't make yourself nuts, you know, <laughs> practical things like that. And more, more focused at a corporate level, though. I, I leave the individual coaching more to people like you. <laughs> Wow, that's that's great. I love it. I'm also curious, by the way, I mean, given it, for me personally, as someone un unlike you, who, you know, is, is, is not an expert at, you know, sort of putting putting the pieces together and, and seeing around corners is the title of, of your, your book is, I mean, I try to be aware of things, but, uh, but it's, it's not uh, necessarily, you know, my thing. I personally felt so blindsided by COVID and by the pandemic, because when I first heard about it, the, you know, the first thing I was just like, oh, well, it's like, it's like SARS. It's like MERS. Like that was my pattern recognition. And I'm like, so this, so this is going to blow over in like five minutes. Like, oh, like people are going to get so, oh, swine flu, you know? And then like, it's not a thing. And so I was completely convinced that it was a hysteria that would blow over. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh, no, that this is different. And I was really surprised about that. And I, I am curious for, you know, for somebody who does this professionally, how, how did the COVID situation, I guess, you know, first of all, a, as you were looking at it, um, were, yeah, I'm assuming you were better prepared to put the pieces together than I was, but how, how has that shaped your view of what it means to see around corners? COVID? 
Yeah. Uh, well, the first thing is that the the nature of a strategic inflection point, as, as I talk about it anyway, is a bit like the old Hemingway story, right? Which is, how did you go bankrupt? Well, gradually and then suddenly. And it totally falls into this pattern. So going back to the Bush administration, uh, there had been very serious people saying 1918 was not a fluke, you know, was not a fluke. Uh, SARS and MERS and diseases like that, uh, avian flu is another one, swine flu, remember that. Um, but they did not become a major thing, at least in the US or in Western Europe, but because it affected measures were in place to contain them. You know, you, I don't know if you remember, but in the early days of things like um, um, the, the, the disease that affected cattle and, and, and indeed SARS and so forth. I mean, there was very, there were very strict protocols at the airports about who could fly. Uh, if you had certain conditions, you just weren't allowed to leave. Because, I mean, it was, there was a lot of coordinated action to contain those pandemics. And in the US, there was actually a pandemic response design. Um, and if you go all the way back to Bill Gates's 2015 TED talk, he said, you know, natural disasters like pandemics, also like hurricanes, also like tornadoes, also like floods, uh, you know, in the moment, there's very little you can do to prepare. So preparation is your friend. Uh, and, and in fact, the only way you're ever going to be successful is having thoughtfully prepared. And, and there, there's a lot that goes with that, right? Distributed resources, the ability to draw in more than one source of sustenance, and, 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 and. Uh, so I would say that my initial reaction, like everybody's, I mean, I'm not a fortune teller. My initial reaction was, whoa, you know, this, this sounds serious. And um, we, in fact, were, my husband and I were about to embark on an international trip to see family right at the end of February. And very, very first indications that this thing was a big deal. And I said to him, I don't think we should go. We could get, we could get stuck in a quarantine. And he said, what? <laughs> you know, really? And uh, and then we dug into it and we ultimately decided not to go. And I was glad for that. Um, yeah, so, you, you want to stay away from the diamond princess. So it was a good move, Frida. That was a good move. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but, you know, to come back to the substance of your question, could I predict it this particular configuration of circumstances as it rolled out? No. Could I have predicted something like this could happen? Yes. And I think this is something that people get wrong about seeing around corners about professionalism, which is the goal of creating these future scenarios. And I talk about articulating time zero events and working backward into what has to be true today for that to be true tomorrow. The goal is not prediction, the goal is preparedness. So the test I would put, Dory, is almost like now we're back in your wheelhouse, which is now that the one of the scenarios, which was possible, has now occurred, were you sufficiently prepared to be able to redirect your attention and resources in a way that made sense? And I think for both you and I, I mean, we're sitting there in February or early January, let's just say, and 2020 is booked, right? You know, you've got your speaking engagements, you've got your book you're working on. I had my exec ad and, you know, all the different conferences we were going to fly off to and Thinkers 50 and, you know, the Drucker Forum and all those guys. Um, and everything's there. And then it was just like within two weeks, it was like this dominoes falling, just one after the other. And for the first time, certainly in my adult life, I was looking at like, there are no airplane trips. <laughs> there, are no, there are no visits to live audiences. And that happened slowly, right? I mean, it, it like the first, it, when it first happened, right? This is all going to blow over by Easter. Then it was all going to be done by the 4th of July. Then it was, oh, we'll be finished with this by the time the school semester starts. Then it'll be over by Christmas. And, <laughs> And I think people have finally stopped predicting when the thing is going to end. At least we've learned not to do that anymore. Um, but I do think there, uh, there, there's a sort of a resilience that comes from saying, okay, let's, let's think about these different scenarios and how well would be, are we just prepared for one or are we prepared for a variety of things? And so when I talk about predictions, no, I didn't predict this, but was it a possibility? Absolutely. Should we have had some resources in reserve just in case? Yes. Uh, one last thing on prediction, um, and I do want to come back to just your portfolio, because I think it's so interesting the way you integrate all this stuff. And we had some questions about your um, mastering, the, the mastery course. Uh, but just before we get to that, um, I think the other sort of last idea on the notion of prediction is um, there are resources that are valuable no matter what's going to happen. And often we under invest in those. And so when something bad happens, right, if we had made those investments and the bad thing doesn't happen, there's always people in the world that say, see, we overreacted. That was no big deal, right? 
Y2K, remember that? There are still people to this day, 20 years later, who are saying, that was not a big deal. We shouldn't have invested all those billions making our systems Y2K compliant. And yet, if we hadn't done it, I suspect the results would have been really, really bad. <laughs> it's it's so true. I mean, I, th- I think the point that you are raising, which I think is so valuable here, and for me, it's probably the biggest lesson that the pandemic hammered home, is that preparing for one scenario is nice, but preparing like the real secret, the real secret sauce, uh, at at least as, as I understand it is to prepare in, in a certain way such that, um, you know, it's like finding the Venn diagram. And if you can prepare in a certain way so that your preparation will serve you in good stead for three out of five possible outcomes, then you are in really good shape because we don't know which one, but if, if there's a, you know, 60 or 70% chance that it's going to be one of them and that thing that you did can cross over, that's about the best we can do. I mean, life is about probabilities and about being ready for, for different situations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, one of our commenters in the chat, uh, Bogdan, I think, says, uh, does this imply a huge amount of cost and effort? And I don't think so. I don't think so. I mean, certainly if you want to go all anal about, you know, what's the precise level of a titanium screw we're going to need for the next space vehicle? Yeah, okay, that requires a fair amount of precision. But if what you're trying to understand is are we looking at a, I'll I'll use a scenario I was working on back in March, you know, are we looking at a chance to rewrite the social contract or not? Are we looking at an economy that's going to start humming again or not? And if you just juxtapose those two uncertainties on each other, you get four completely viable, as of last March, futures. So one I call Les Miserables, right? Lots of conflict over resources, lots of tension. Not a happy place to be. Uh, Second is just kind of rinse and repeat the last 50 years. Third is a return to the, the FDR, you know, the rendezvous with destiny. And the fourth, and remember, this is last March, I was talking about these. And the fourth was sort of Great Society 2.0. And what seems to be the trend right now is landing us in the rendezvous with destiny kind of scenario. Now, that I think is, I happen to think that has a lot of positives to it. Um, oh, one thing also, I think it's very important not to get preferences confused with predictions, <laughs> which is easy to do. Like that's a scenario I would really like. So I'm going to see and take in all the information that supports that being the place we're going. And I'm going to completely ignore everything that calls that into question. And that's another thing we don't want to do. Does it have to be super expensive? No. Does it require you the patience and the tenacity to expand your mind. Yes. And that takes time, as you've already said. Yeah, absolutely. And you you were kind of heading in this direction, Rita, so I'll just pick up the strand that specifically how all of this tied in with, with COVID and sort of my uh, reinventions and you know my multiple income streams, which is the topic of the new book, uh, Entrepreneurial You, what, what was a, a powerful lesson for me was I... So back, you know, we go back in time five years ago um, and, you know, for the, that, you know, five, seven year period speaking, keynote speaking and traveling, of course, to do it was a significant part of my income. And I, you know, I was constantly on the road and in 2015, I actually gave 74 keynote talks. So I was on the road all the time. It was brutal. And finally, at the end of that year, I said, okay, that's too many. I need to do less than that. And that was the moment where I, two very clear scenarios presented themselves to me in terms of like forecasting. One is like, okay, there's probably going to be a point where I get burned out on travel and don't want to travel so much, the personal preference. The second is, you know, God forbid, but maybe I get sick, you know, and I see friends who have illnesses or things like that. They just can't do it. And if it's dependent on your labor, then you're in trouble. And so I realized very clearly, okay, if you know, if that is the case, I am going to have to come up with ways that I can have more passive income, ways that I can earn revenue that is not dependent on my physical presence somewhere. And so I started going all in, you know, 2014 was my first uh, stop, but, uh, but 2015, 2016, I did a lot in terms of investing in developing online courses. This was really part of the 20% time. Wasn't, you know, a huge percentage, but, but it was a steady percentage that I spent over uh, several years. And it turns out, hey, guess what? Who knew um, the same things that enabled me to prepare for what I saw as the likely scenarios about I might get sick of travel or might get sick in general, it worked for the the pandemic as well because the speaking income cratered, 
but online went up. And so, you know, I feel very lucky. 2020 was my most lucrative year ever because of that preparation that, that I had done kind of inadvertently, but planning for adjacent scenarios. Yeah, I mean, we had the same experience in um, executive education at Columbia, which is, you know, we had our whole year booked in January and February looked great. And then March, all of a sudden, the floor fell out of everything. We had to cancel all of our live classes. Um, and I was actually one of the first faculty to suggest that, you know, we could reimagine this experience. And so what we got now is a portfolio of what we call live online classes, where it's it's over Zoom or some format like it. Um, but it's an actual conversation. And you know, what we're learning now, which I think is fascinating, is some of what we're doing actually works better in this format. And I'm thinking about even the keynote speeches. So like you, you know, I used to spend a lot of time in airplane, <laughs> you know, going to places. But when you get to, say, Radio City Music Hall or this huge venue that they have in Sao Paulo in Brazil, um, you know, you on the stage, as far as the average observer is, you know, you're this teeny little thing <laughs> And they're actually watching the Jumbotron, which is trained on you as a video. And so in many ways, this experience is actually a lot richer, a lot more human. You can have much more interactivity. Um, and I'm not saying it's better than, you know, in person. I think it's different. And we will, I think, through this experience, we're going to learn what actually are its advantages and how do they manifest themselves. So with women in leadership, for instance, I've got women now from all over the world and men, men are allowed too, but mostly it's women. And, you know, women in the not-for-profit sector who no way could they have afforded to fly to New York, stay in a hotel, go to the court. I mean, they just could not have done it. They would have been barred out. And so to be able to welcome them in has been just, it's been great. And, uh, and that's a really positive aspect. So I think we're learning, you know, much, much as we mourn what we've lost in terms of interpersonal, I think we're learning a lot of new things that are, we never would have even considered in the before times. And now, now it's like, well, why not give it a try? Nothing else is available to us, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Nothing, nothing like utter lack of options to <laughs> inspire creativity. Oh, wait a minute. I see one of your companions. Oh, yes. He, he so likes these guys. He, these guys are Twitter stars, I have to tell you. <laughs> and Instagram as well. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. This is this is Philip. He's the uh, he's the power behind the throne. You want to say hi, and, Phil? Hey. Oh, hi. Yeah. Everyone's <laughs> looking at you. <laughs> Welcome, world. Welcome, world. Great. So um, um, that. Tell me a little bit about the different flows because you've got you've got the online course and there's a lot of interest I know in people learning more about the recognized expert course, but you've got some others. Uh, you've got the books. You are still doing virtual speaking and meeting and you do coaching. So how do you balance between all those things? Yeah, thank you. It's uh, there. There are a lot of a lot of different income streams and a lot of different things that I have going one of the questions that I get sometimes, or, you know, objections, you could say, depending how they're phrased, uh, with regard to the idea of, of people creating multiple income streams is they say, well, you know, that, yeah, that sounds nice, but like, how would I have time? Or it seems so complicated or how, you know, how do you sort of manage this complex unwieldy thing? And I think it's really important to specify that the, the multiple revenue streams, it is not like nine, completely different things, right? It's not, oh, well, I write business books and I own car washes and, uh, you know, I'm an angel investor and I breed horses. Like it's not, it's not all of those things that really would, you know, pull you in a million directions because it's, it's different audiences. It's different knowledge bases. It's kind of too many things to wrap your arms around, uh, at once. What I suggest instead is that you you have kind of a core. It's like a core of your IP and a core of your audience. And then you think about different ways to apply it. Because ultimately the goal, you know, as, as Jeff Bezos talks about and, uh, and Jim Collins is, you know, you create a flywheel and you want people to enter at a certain point and they become your best customers because, you know, in the flywheel, they're like, oh, well, you know, that sounds good too. So in my case, somebody might read my book and then, you know, that's $20. It's relatively low risk. And they say, oh, this is, this is interesting. Um, I, you know, I like this. I'll sign up for one of your courses. And so that, you know, there's a $200 course, there's a $2,000 course. They can, you know, dive in and, ex and experiment with that. A lot of people who take the courses say, oh, well, you know, this is really good, but I want to see how it applies to me. I need personal help. And they sign up for coaching, which is, you know, $30,000. And so, you know, we go, 
from there. Um, so it's it's creating different ways. You know, I mean, it's, it's like different ways for the same people to engage with you based on their preferences. And also, how do you sort of broaden it out so that people who couldn't necessarily afford you at the highest levels are able to to get in the pipeline nonetheless. If you can answer those questions, then it doesn't it doesn't really become hard to have multiple revenue streams. It's just sort of creative extensions to grow your audience and to grow your ability to to um, interact more deeply with your existing audience. Mm-hmm. And it's also around the same coherent set of I'll call it IP or, you know, the same coherent brand really comes through all those things. You know, it's, it's different ways the brand might be expressed. Um, so, you know, to use an analogy, right, when you think of Disney, you know, there's certain consistent things, whether you're in a theme park, whether you're watching a movie, whether you're streaming something, you know, it's about the story, it's about the imagination, it's about the creativity, it's ultimately it's about the customer experience, whatever the venue is that you're in. So that might be a way of thinking about it. A quick question on what's better online. Um, it was Frank, I guess, it was asking that. Um, and I'll take a stab at it, and then maybe maybe you can. Um, I think online, it's it's the access. Uh, in the case of some of our course offerings, it's the ability to take something that in person would be, say, a three day drinking from a fire hose experience, and stretching it out in time so that you have more time to reflect, more time to digest, more time to interact with your peers. And we're finding that uh, the communities that you build can be very different than those you would build if you were in an in-person environment. So to take a little bit of research, in an in-person environment, we tend to hang out with people who are a lot like us. So you know, if we're Americans and we're in an international study, we hang out with all the other Americans. And so your ability to really intentionally create connections beyond your normal, they call it homophily group, you know, the people that are like you, uh, is harder, I think, in an in-person because there's so much social pressure. Whereas in an online, you know, you, if somebody, say, from India has an interesting point, I can reach out to them without it being weird and say, you know, I really love the point Shweta raised. Um, I'd love to elaborate on that. And so you can get a lot richer dialogue going in, 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 in some ways. And again, it's not like being in person. I think it's different. But we've learned that there are interesting things that would not be possible in person that are possible now. So I don't know, Dory, what do you think about that question? Yeah, I think that's that's super interesting, Rita. In terms of what's better internationally, uh, or, or sorry, what's, what's better uh, virtually, uh, I think the international element really is key. I mean, I taught in November my first virtual iteration of a class that I've been teaching for years at Duke Fuqua School of Business called Communication for Leaders. And we had a guy participate who was a, a dean of a university in New Zealand. And I mean, you know, I, I think like it's not impossible that someone would fly from New Zealand for like a three-day executive ed program, but it's unlikely. I had never, I had never had anyone do that before. But this guy uh, was now able to to participate and, and be part of it and, and get get that knowledge. And um, you know, so I think I think it opens up. Uh, it just, you know, continues to kind of break down barriers and, and globalize in really dramatic ways, which uh, which is pretty cool. An interesting thing, actually, as well, that um, I am not an expert in, but I have read about and been intrigued by, is that for people with disabilities, that actually the the virtual environment, um, you know, I guess depending depending on your disability, uh, has been really transformative because. Um, you're able to to interact in a way that um, that you know doesn't necessarily call attention to uh, to your disability. It's less visible, uh, and and so you know I've been reading accounts of of people feeling like oh wow you know this is I mean this is not necessarily a great statement about humanity, but it's like wow people are treating me so differently because it's not so obvious that you know I'm in a wheelchair or that uh, you know that I'm a little person or whatever the case may be, and so I think it's it's interesting uh, as kind of a thought experiment, I mean, presumably more and more will go back to virtual, uh, you know, sort of like like hybrid type things. But if you're able to build relationships with people, um, I would imagine that, you know, the dynamic is going to be uh, different and, and hopefully more inclusive and more respectful when we do uh, revert to more in-person communication. So I think kind of watching watching the trends and watching the sociology of all of that is uh, is really interesting to behold. 
Yeah. Yeah. I hadn't thought about that, but you're absolutely right. And there's a, a great company actually that was founded um, on an online workforce that's on the autism spectrum. And it turns out among the things people that have that particular neurological makeup can do that other people really struggle with is this ability to like intensely concentrate on very specific tasks for long periods of time that most of us just our brains just go <laughs> get get out of it oh my goodness we're nearly out of time um so how do people learn more how do they become part of your world even if at only the book level <laughs> oh well thank you so much rita i appreciate it that's uh that's great i would say that uh, if folks want to learn more um you know about about the books and about all the different things. Uh, the best place to go is my website. It's doryclark.com. And one of the things that I'm really uh, proudest of is I have a, a self-assessment that if people want to really think through in their own life, how to, we've been spending a lot of time talking about reinvention. If you want to think through your own uh, sort of brand and also your, you know, if you're planning a reinvention or thinking about that in your career, uh, it's a free self-assessment and you can get it at doryclark.com slash reinvent. <laughs> I love it. That's what a great note to end on and uh, to be continued. So uh, thank you everyone for joining us. Thank you, Dory, for making the time. I'm really looking forward to seeing you for coffee, like in person in New York, but until then we will make it work on Zoom or wherever. <laughs> so thanks very much, everybody. And uh, till next week. Right. So long. <laughs> <laughs>